Hi everybody, Stuart Clayton here from Baseline Publishing. I'm pleased to announce that I've just released my beginner bass video course, which contains hours and hours of video lessons for aspiring bassists. If you're a complete beginner, this would be a great course for you, but it would also be beneficial to those who have been playing for a couple of years and maybe need to brush up on the basics or correct some bad habits. This course will show you how to correctly use all of the main playing techniques, It'll help you to learn the notes on the fingerboard and it will give you all the tools that you need for creating your own bass lines. Throughout the course I also cover basic reading techniques and some simple music theory, so there's a huge amount here for you to get your teeth into. This video is a free sample of the course featuring the first 90 minutes of material which covers all of the absolute basics. If you enjoy this video and you want to see the whole course, just check out the link below. All of my video courses are available through one simple subscription and they're some of the most affordable courses on the internet. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this video and uh, do be sure to leave comments and questions in the uh, box below. In this video, we're gonna be looking at the basic anatomy of the bass guitar, just looking at all of the main components on the instrument. So let's make a start with the most obvious one, which is the body of the bass. Now nine times out of ten the body of the instrument is going to be made out of wood and if you look at your own instrument you're going to find that the edges of the, uh, of the body are contoured and there's a large chamfered area down here at the back of the instrument that's where your arm typically comes across uh, to play the bass and all of that contouring and chamfering is done for comfort. You don't want any sharp edges digging into your arms when you're playing. So that's the body of the bass. The next uh, obvious component is the neck. This is where the fingerboard or fretboard is mounted and that leads us to this uh, mass of wood down at the end of the base, which is known as the headstock. This is where the tuning pegs are mounted. So those are the three main structural elements of the base. The body, the neck, which is where the fretboard is mounted, and the headstock. Okay, so the next one to consider is the frets themselves. Now the frets uh, are thin pieces of wire that divide the fretboard up into individual notes. So uh, each, uh, each different model of bass has uh, different numbers of frets and the instrument that I'm playing here is what's called a Fender Jazz Bass, a very, very common instrument. You'll see these in music shops uh, everywhere. And the Fender Jazz Bass has 20 frets. So up here is fret number 20 and down here is fret number 1, 2, 3, etc. As I said, most basses have uh, about 20 frets. Some might have 22, some might have 24. The number of frets that you have is largely irrelevant at this stage. It's really not going to make any difference to you uh, as you're learning to play the instrument. So those are the frets. Uh, moving on, the next component that we need to consider is this uh, assembly down here. This is what's known as the bridge of the instrument. This is where the strings are connected and when you're installing new strings this is where they'll first pass through and then obviously be attached to the tuning pegs down the end. Now the bridge has a number of different adjustment points on it. Um, you shouldn't need to mess with these for the moment but uh, just so you're aware what you have here. You'll notice that each string passes over what's known as a bridge saddle and you'll see some uh, allen key adjustment points on there for raising and lowering the height of the string just in case you need the strings higher or lower for some reason. So we've got all of that going on down here. There are also screws in the end of the bridge that control what's known as the intonation. Now if you've uh, just got, got your first bass from a music shop and you've had it um, and you've played it and you know you're comfortable with it, you shouldn't need to touch any of that stuff at all. So you've got various adjustment points down here on the bridge but as I said you shouldn't need to worry about those for the moment. Moving on, we have the pickups of the instrument. Uh, most bass guitars have two pickups. Your bass might only have one, but um, that's okay as well. So uh, on a two pickup instrument, we refer to the pickup that's nearest the bridge as the bridge pickup, and the pickup that's closest to the neck as the neck pickup. Fairly unsurprising names there, but they are uh, quite important to remember. So those are our pickups. Um, moving on, we have uh, strap buttons at the uh, there's one here at the end of the the top uh, section of the body and you'll find another one down here on the edge uh, just behind the bridge that's obviously where you're going to be attaching the strap of the instrument to uh, looking back down onto the headstock we have the tuning pegs one for each string that's where you're going to adjust the tuning of the instrument we're going to cover that in a later video and the final component that i want to draw your attention to is uh, the, the various assembly of sort of knobs and controls and things that you might have on your bass 
Now, there's lots and lots of different uh, models of bass guitar out there, and these are going to be different from model to model. In the next video, we're going to look in more detail at what the, uh, the, what the pickups sound like and what all of these different controls do on, on various different instruments. Uh, but for the moment, all you need to really know is that you're going to have various adjustments down here for the volume of the instrument and the tone of the instrument. As I said, in the next video, we'll look in a little bit more detail at what these controls do on various different types of bass guitar. So those are the main components of the instrument. If this is all brand new to you, it's worth spending a little bit of time just familiarising yourself with the names uh, of these, uh, these uh, uh, different components. As I said, in the next video, we'll be taking a look at the pickups and the controls of the instrument in a bit more detail. We're now going to spend some time looking at the controls of the bass guitar and what they do. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you four different bass guitars and explain the different controls that they've got and the sounds that you can get out of them. So the first instrument that I'm going to show you is this one. This is what's known as a Fender Precision Bass. This is a very, very popular instrument. This was the very first commercially available bass guitar. This was released by Leo Fender back in 1951. And to this day, it's still one of the most popular kinds of bass guitar uh, you can get your hands on. You'll find these in music shops everywhere. So very, very popular, very common instrument. Now, part of the reason for the popularity of the precision bass, or P bass as it's known, is its simplicity. It uh, doesn't have an awful lot of uh, it doesn't have an awful lot of options when it comes to tone, and that's uh, in many ways a good thing because there's not too much to mess about with. So you'll find that there's just one pickup, which is a, what we call a split coil pickup, and we have two controls. The forwardmost control is a master volume and the control to the rear is a master tone control. Now the way that I personally prefer to use the P bass is with the tone control all the way on and uh, it's going to sound like this. Now that's a great bass tone, something that's going to work for all styles of music, a really good kind of one size fits all sound. Now if I take the tone control and roll it all the way off, I'm going to have a much deeper sort of woollier sound, a kind of sound that's going to work really nicely on uh, kind of more uh, old school sounds if you like, Motown and Soul and that kind of thing. So with the tone control rolled all the way back, the bass now sounds like this. So as you can hear, there's a fairly distinct difference um, depending on what you do with the tone control. Now I've just shown you that tone control in the, the two extreme examples, all the way on and all the way off. But of course you have sort of various points in between there where you can uh, you can mix the tone to your own uh, your own sort of uh, preferences. So that's the Fender P bass, a very simple instrument, a very simple control set. And if you have one of these, uh, it won't take you very long to get acquainted with it. Okay, let's take a look at another instrument. The next bass guitar that we're going to take a look at is the Fender Jazz Bass. Now the Jazz Bass was released in 1960 as a fairly substantial update, if you like, to the, to the P Bass. And alongside some refinements in terms of its playability and construction, the most notable difference between the P Bass and the Jazz Bass is the addition of a second pickup. So the Jazz Bass has two pickups where the P Bass only had the one. Now the jazz bass quickly became very popular and to this day it remains one of the most popular bass guitars of all times and many of today's top professional bass players still favour the jazz bass above all else. So incredibly popular instrument and you'll find them in guitar shops all over the world very, very easily. Now in terms of uh, what we have going on with the control set on the jazz bass, because we have an additional pickup we've got a little bit more to work with. So we have three controls and what we have is a uh, volume control here for the uh, for the neck pickup, which is closest to the neck. We have a volume control for the bridge pickup, which is closest to the bridge. And then we have a master tone control. And uh, what I'm going to do first of all is I'm going to demonstrate the tone of the, uh, the neck pickup in isolation. I've got the tone control turned all the way up and I'm just going to be using the neck pickup. And what you're going to hear is that the sound that I'm going to get out of this bass is very similar to what we had from the, uh, from the P bass uh, earlier in the, in the video. So it sounds like this.
And of course, the reason it sounds so similar to a P bass is that we have a single pickup in use in the center point of the, the body, and we've got the tone control on full. So very uh, similar sound to the P bass when you're just using this pickup in isolation. Now it's worth mentioning at this point, if you're using just the neck pickup, you get a really nice slap bass sound, really good uh, for getting that kind of vintage old school 60s slap bass sound. So that's a very popular sound and it's uh, achieved by using the neck pickup on a Fender jazz bass. Okay, so let's check out what the bridge pickup sounds like. So I'm gonna turn off the neck pickup and turn the bridge pickup up all the way. And what you're gonna find with this sound is that it's a much, uh, a much kind of brighter, punchier sound, a little bit thinner in places, but it's a really nice sound for, uh, for punching through a mix and it works really, really nicely for finger style uh, funk grooves. <laughs> Now, what I've shown you so far is the sound of the jazz bass uh, at e either end of the spectrum, if you like. So we've listened to the neck pickup in isolation and the bridge pickup in isolation. Uh, but really, what a lot of bass players do is they use both pickups on full. And in fact, the uh, one of the most popular ways of using a Fender jazz bass is just to turn everything up full. So both pickups and the tone control. And if you do that, you get this sound. <laughs> Now that's a great one size fits all tone. Uh, that, uh, that works really well no matter what technique you're using, whether you're playing with the finger style technique or with the slap technique or using a pick uh, and whatever style of music you're playing, that tone works really, really well. That is a classic bass tone. So Fender Jazz Bass with everything turned up full is, uh, is a bit of a classic. Now, just before we finish up, I just want to mention that the bass that I'm actually using here is not actually a Fender jazz bass. It is a jazz style instrument, but it was built by an independent luthier as a, as a kind of jazz bass replica. And this is actually fairly common, and most of the main uh, manufacturers of basses uh, do their own kind of take on a jazz bass, if you like, um, such as the, the popularity of the model. So this isn't actually a Fender jazz bass, but it does have exactly the same pickups and controls as a jazz bass would. Okay, let's take a look at another instrument. Okay, so the next instrument that we're gonna take a look at is this one. This is what's known as a Music Man Stingray bass. Now this is another instrument that was designed by Leo Fender, but uh, a few years after the, the uh, precision and jazz basses, uh, at this point he left Fender and started a new company called Music Man. And this was uh, the Stingray bass, which was released in 1976. You'll see that it has a similar body shape to the Fender P and Jazz basses, uh, but in pretty much every other way, it's a much more refined looking instrument. And uh, there's a, a number of distinguishing characteristics of the Music Man bass that, that make them really noticeable, uh, such as this uh, oval scratch plate, the, uh, the single large pickup with the exposed pole pieces, and the headstock with the three and one tuning peg configuration. All of those characteristics are really uh, um, really make the Music Man Stingray bass very, uh, very recognisable. Now this is a, a fairly significant update on the previous basses that, that Leo designed and it's a much more powerful and gutsy sounding instrument. So very, very uh, powerful sound that you get out of one of these. And that's really thanks to this, this large uh, pickup, which is known as a humbucking pickup. On the uh, P bass and jazz basses, we had single coil pickups and this is what's known as a humbucker. Now, in addition to that, we've got active circuitry on uh, Music Man basses, and that simply means that there's a battery on board, there's a nine volt battery in the back, and that's powering the electronics, uh, making for a much more powerful sound. So let's take a look at the control set on this bass. We've got three controls. Uh, as we've only got this single pickup, we have one master volume control. The next control is a treble control and then we have a bass control. Now what this means is that the, this bass has a two band EQ, and that means that you can control two separate EQ bands independently, so treble and bass. Now because this bass has active circuitry, what you'll find is that there is a center click point on these tone controls. You can find that in the middle there, and that means that if you turn the control forward, you can boost that frequency, and if you turn it backward, you can cut it and this is a feature of active electronics. So quite a lot of 
tonal versatility possible from this instrument. Now I'm just going to demonstrate this uh, this bass using its most basic sound. So I've got the volume on full and I've got both of the tone controls centered and I'm just going to play you a very basic finger style groove so you can hear what it sounds like. Now this instrument is also very very popular with slap players uh, because it has a really sort of distinctive and gutsy kind of tone. So I'm just going to play you a slap bass groove using the same tone configuration. <laughs> Now, of course, there's quite a lot that you can do in addition to what I've already shown you uh, in terms of uh, mixing the uh, the treble and bass frequencies in different ratios. There's an awful lot that you can do there in terms of uh, adjusting the, the the sound, much more than I can go into here. But for the most part, it's a, a reasonably simple instrument to get your head around, a master tone control, sorry, a master volume control, and then independent tone controls for treble and bass. Now, I should say at this point, if you have a Music Man bass and it has four controls on it, it's very likely that you've got a three band EQ. So you would have a master volume control and then treble, middle, and bass. So you'd be able to control three different EQ bands, treble, middle, and bass. That's a, another possibility that you might find on the Music Man Stingray. Okay, let's take a look at one final instrument. Just wanna show you one final example of a bass guitar, and that is a modern active bass. Now, I'm holding a fairly unusual looking bass guitar here. This is a five string bass and it's headless, so no headstock and no tuning pegs down here. This instrument's actually tuned by using some uh, some knobs down here on, on the bridge, but it's not really what we're looking at in this, uh, in this video. This is uh, actually just a great example of uh, a modern active bass with uh, five controls, which is, which is really quite common. So we ignore these two uh, toggle switches that I've got here. Let's just take a look at these five controls. Now, the first one here is a master volume control that affects the, the volume of the entire instrument. And then back here we have a pickup uh, selector control. This has got a center point. Now if I have it clicked into the center point, I'll be using each of these two pickups equally. If I was to turn the control all the way to the back, I would be using the bridge pickup in isolation. All the way to the front would be the neck pickup in isolation. So at that center point, I'm using both pickups equally. Now, just with that single control, you've got an awful lot of tonal possibilities because if you were to just move slightly forward of the center click point, you'd be using uh, mostly the uh, neck pickup with just a little bit of uh, with bridge pickup. Similarly, you could go just slightly back and you'd be using a little bit more of the bridge pickup than you would of the neck pickup. So you've got loads and loads of different ratios uh, of mixing between the two pickups that you can you can find just in that sort of sweep of that control. So lots and lots of tonal options just using the pickup selector there. Now the other three controls that I've got here are a three band EQ, treble, middle, and bass. And again, each one of these has center click points. It's an active bass, batteries in the back. So center click points on each of these controls. And that means that I can boost and cut any of these frequencies. Now, what you get with uh, a modern active bass, which is uh, very, very common in, in many instruments, is uh, you get a, basically a huge variety of tonal options. So with the, uh, the, the combination of the two pickups and all the various different ratios that you can find between them, combined with the three band EQ, you can get an awful lot of different sounds out of, uh, out of an instrument like this, uh, far more than I could uh, illustrate in uh, in the time that we have here. Now, what I would say to you is whatever instrument you have, just make sure you understand what each of the controls does. So do refer to the manual that came with it or have a look online to see what each of those controls does and make sure you fully understand what each of them what each of them does. If you have an instrument with five controls such as this one, the, the three band EQ, the pickup selector and the volume, what I recommend that you do for the moment is just set everything at that center click point because that'll give you a great uh, one size fits all tone that'll, that'll work for pretty much everything that you want to do for the moment. With time and experience, you'll learn how to sort of uh, adjust the EQ to, cert to suit various different situations. But for the moment, I recommend leaving everything flat. Okay, let's move on and look at amplification.
It's perfectly possible to sit around playing the bass guitar acoustically, but I think it's more likely that you're going to want to get hold of an amplifier so you can uh, hear more clearly what you're actually doing. Now, before you rush out and buy your first amplifier, I think it's worth knowing um, the, the kinds of choices that you have available to you. And amplifiers typically come in one of two categories. You can either buy a stack or a combo. Now, a stack is separate components. So that would be a speaker cabinet, maybe one, maybe two cabinets, with a separate amplifier uh, usually placed on top. So all of those three things would be separate. Now a stack is usually the more expensive option so it might be that in the early days of your playing you might want to consider getting hold of a combo instead. And a combo is, uh, is really just a speaker cabinet and an amplifier all housed within a single unit and the benefit of getting hold of a combo is that they're nice and portable and uh, much more affordable than, than buying a stack. So uh, if, you're, if you're just starting out playing the bass, I recommend getting hold of a combo. You can get fairly small combos that are just suitable for home practice, and then slightly bigger ones that would be good for both home practice and maybe going out and doing a little bit of uh, small gigging as well. So there's a few different options available there for you to, to look into. Now, you'll also need to get hold of a guitar cable or a guitar lead, and uh, this is a, an example of one of those. This is what's known as a jack-to-jack -jack lead. Uh, you get these in any guitar shop, very simple, and all you really need for the moment is a basic jack-to-jack -jack lead, maybe about six feet long. Uh, they, they come in lots of different lengths, and you can get them really quite long for, um, for use on stage, but uh, if you're just going to be practicing at home, six foot is, uh, is more than enough. Now, that's about it, really, for amplification, but there is one thing that I want to say uh, before finishing this video, and that is that it's very, very important um, which order you plug, it, uh, plug things in. And the way that you need to do this is plug the cable into your bass guitar first and then plug into the amplifier. Okay, it's very important that you do that. Otherwise, you're going to, if you plug into the amp first and then into the bass guitar, you can have a, a live amp and you're going to plug into the bass. You're going to get a really loud bang as the, uh, the speaker reacts as the, as the plug goes in. So have the lead in the bass first and then plug into the amp. And similarly, when you come to unplug, take the lead out of the amp first and then out of the bass, not the other way around. You'll soon, uh, you'll soon figure this out when you, when you hear the, the kind of awful noise that you make when you do it the wrong way around. Okay, uh, that's it for amplification. In the next video, we're going to look at ways of sitting and standing with the bass. It's very important that you give some consideration to the way that you hold the bass, whether you're sitting or standing with the instrument. Now, what I recommend is that you try to set the length of your strap so that the bass stays in roughly the same place on your body, whether you're sitting down and practicing or standing up. Now, it might look a little bit high on my body at this point, but if I'm standing up, it'll, it'll sit a little bit lower. But that's what I recommend that you try and do. And the reason for that really is that you don't want to be in a situation where you do all your practicing at home and get used to the instrument feeling a certain way. And then you go out and try and play live with a different strap position and you're going to find that everything's different because the angles in your arms are going to be uh, different. If you Just imagine if you did all your practice uh, sitting around in this kind of position, then you went out and played uh, live with your bass much lower, for example, you're going to find that all the stuff that you did in the practice room that uh, maybe felt quite easy is going to be significantly more challenging because the bass is just going to be in a completely different position on your body. So I recommend trying to keep it in roughly the same place on your body whether you're sitting or standing. Now, the real benefit of that is that you're going to have fairly uh, relaxed angles in each of your wrists, which is going to be much better for your long-term uh, kind of physical health as you're playing the instrument. So with the, with the bass in this sort of position, you've got a nice smooth angle in the wrist of your fretting hand and in the wrist of your uh, of your picking hand as well. Now if you have your bass really high on your body, for example, the angle that your hand comes over the body when playing finger style is going to be much more severe and you're going to put a lot of pressure on your tendons uh, in your picking hand, which, which you don't want to do. And similarly, if you wear your bass really, really low, you're going to find that the uh, your fretting hand is going to be um, at a much more severe angle with your bass down low. And uh, again, that can lead to quite significant discomfort and, uh, and problems with your wrists. Uh, later on. So you want to try and avoid any of that by keeping the bass in a reasonably static position, sitting and standing, and making sure you have nice smooth angles in each of your uh, wrists as you're playing. When you're learning to play a new musical instrument, one of the most important things to figure out early on is how to get it in tune, and that's what we're going to cover in this video. 
So I'm starting out with a very badly out of tune bass guitar. Sounds pretty terrible and we're going to work through a process of getting it into tune. Now the way that we're going to do this is we're going to get the top string of the bass in tune first, the G string, that's the highest pitched string. We're going to get that, uh, that string in tune first and then we're going to use that as a reference for tuning all of the other strings. Now there's a few different ways in which you could get that, uh, that G string in tune. You could use a piano keyboard as a reference pitch, you could use a tuning pedal, you could use a tuning app on your phone, or you could use a clip-on tuner. And that's what we're gonna do, we're gonna use a clip-on tuner. I've got one on the end of the bass here, I'm gonna switch it on. And the top string should obviously be a G. And at the moment it's showing an F sharp, so I need to tune up. And it's very clear to see when you're getting So I've got that top string in tune there, that's a G. Now at this point, it's probably quite tempting for you to think, okay, well, I'll, I'll use the clip-on tuner to tune all of the other strings as well. And that is a very fast and accurate way of getting the bass in tune. So that would certainly work really well. But the problem with doing that, and in, indeed the problem with using a tuning pedal or a tuning app or any of these kind of electronic devices, is they don't really encourage you to use your ear as much uh, as you could be doing. And that's one of the most important things for a young bass player to do, learn how to tune the instrument by ear. And that's what we're gonna, that's what we're gonna be covering in this video. So we've got one string in tune and we're gonna use our ears to get the other three strings in tune. Now the open G string should sound the same as the G at the fifth fret of the, the D string. So if I play the open G first, that's the note that's in tune. <laughs> the G at the fifth fret of the D string, you can hear that they're not the same. Hopefully you can hear that the, uh, the second note, the one that's out of tune, is lower than the first one. It's very important when you're doing this that you play the note that is in tune first. So there's the, the G, that's in tune. Very close now, but you can still hear some friction there. It's practically there now, but you can still hear a wobbling noise. Need to get rid of that. Almost there, just a little bit more. Just a tiny, tiny bit more. Okay, and eventually you'll get to this point where you have both notes the same. Open G and the G in the fifth fret of the D string. And that means that the G string and the D string are now in tune. So we've tuned half of the strings on the bass. Now we're gonna uh, repeat that process. So the, uh, the D at the fifth fret of the A string should sound the same as the open D string. So here's the open D and here's the fifth fret of the A string. It's not even close at the moment. The second one's lower, so we need to tune up. It's close. Very close indeed. So we've got the A string in tune there. So we've just got one final string to do, and that's the low E. So open A, and then the A at the fifth fret of the E string should be the same. That's quite far down, isn't it? Let's tune that up. It's close. That's pretty much there. 
Okay, so that's a really good method for learning how to tune the bass. When you're first starting out doing this, it might take you five to 10 minutes to get this done. I know when I was first learning how to play, this took a long time to do, but I'm really glad that I, I did pursue doing this, uh, this using my ear method because it's uh, really valuable to the development of your, of your ears. And as you can imagine, that's really important for a musician. Now at this point where you've, uh, you're pretty sure you've got everything in tune, at this point, by all means, switch on the tuner again and check everything that you've done. So the G has just slipped a little bit, and just tweak that back up to a G. Go the D, pretty much there. A string, that's okay. And the E string is there as well. So we've now got the bass in tune. And that's, as I said, a really good method for getting the bass guitar in tune, and it makes you use your ears rather than using an electronic device. So uh, in these early days, that's definitely the method that I recommend that you use. In, uh, later on in this beginner course, we're gonna look at, a, at another way of tuning the bass, uh, again, using this kind of method, but um, slightly different. And, uh, but until then, this is the way that I recommend that you tune the instrument. If you're new to the bass guitar, you're probably looking at the fingerboard and thinking, wow, I've got a lot of notes to learn. And whilst that is true in some senses, uh, you'll soon discover that there's an awful lot of repetition on the fingerboard, and that's gonna make learning all of these notes quite a lot easier. Now, what we're gonna look at in this video is just a few notes that are good ones to know before you dive into the, into the main part of the course. Now, before we do any of that, we need to make sure we know the names of the open strings. So the, uh, the highest pitched string on the bass, as you probably know already, is the G string. That's this one uh, at the top. Now we, we say top, even though it's, it's physically lower than the other strings, it's in, in terms of its pitch, it's the highest pitched string. So the highest pitched string on your bass is the G string. Moving down to the next string, we have a D, then an A, and the lowest string is the E. So we have G, D, A, and E. That's the first thing that you're gonna to need to remember. Okay, now that immediately leads us to some relatively straightforward notes to memorize on the bass guitar. So if we move to the 12th fret of the bass guitar, that's usually marked with a, a position marker or two dots. Uh, I've got two dots on the top edge of my bass here, which you won't be able to see, but you can see a position marker here at the 12th fret. Uh, that's the octave fret. So that means that these notes here are the same as the open strings. We have G, D, A, and E. So the same notes, but an octave higher. So there's open G, and the G at the 12th fret. Open D, D at the 12th fret. Open A. So those are important ones to memorize first off. So G, D, A, and E. Now there's probably four other notes or three other notes that you know already if you've worked through the, uh, the video on tuning the bass because we use the fifth fret notes as references. And you probably remember that the fifth fret of the E string is an A, it's the same pitch as the open A string. There's the open A, there's the A at the fifth fret of the E string. So we probably know these notes already. So we have an A here at the fifth fret of the E string we have a D at the fifth fret of the A string. We have a G at the fifth fret of the D string. And then the only note that we didn't use when we were tuning is this note here at the fifth fret of the G string. This note is a C. So we have an A, a D, a G, and a C. So we've just covered eight notes. We've got the notes at the 12th fret, and we've got the notes at the fifth fret. Now, if you can just remember those for the moment, that's a great place uh, to be at when you uh, dive into the main part of the, of the video course. Now, one thing, final thing that I'd like to mention is that the, the neck of the bass guitar uh, typically has position markers, and you can see them really clearly on this instrument. There's a marker here at fret one, at fret three, five, seven, nine, and 12. Now, these markers don't actually uh, 
uh, mean anything in particular. They're really just navigation aids. You get used to knowing that you have markers at the third, fifth, seventh fret, etc. So it's just a really good way of putting your hands on notes that you that you know. So it's just worth being aware that most basses have these markers at the third, fifth, seventh, ninth, and twelfth frets and beyond. But we don't need to worry about that part of the bass for the moment. And some basses have them at the first fret as well. This one does. Some don't. Okay, so don't worry if your bass doesn't have a marker at the first fret. Okay, uh, those are some basic notes for you to memorise. As we get into the video courses themselves, we'll be introducing more notes along the way. In this video, we're just going to talk about the basics of music notation. Now, you certainly don't need to learn how to read music in order to play the bass guitar successfully, and you're probably aware of many well-known bass players who can't read at all, and that's, uh, that's completely fine. But it's really valuable to have a good idea of, of the basics of, of reading, and certainly if you're planning on pursuing music professionally, being able to read to a basic level will be an incredibly valuable skill for you, so definitely something that I recommend pursuing. Now, this is not going to be a reading music course, we're just going to be looking at some of the basics in this video, and then as we work throughout the, uh, the beginner course as a whole, we'll be introducing a few concepts along the way that'll be useful to you, but as I said, this is not a reading music course. Okay, so uh, bass guitar music is notated on a five line stave, just as uh, all other music is, and uh, we use something called the bass clef, which is shown at the beginning of each line. And the bass clef is a curled symbol with two dots, and it's sometimes referred to as the F clef, because those two dots that you can see sit either side of the line that holds the note F. So the bass clef is sometimes referred to as the F clef. Now, the first thing that you're going to need to know if you're going to be pursuing written music is the locations of the open strings on the stave. So as you can see from the uh, illustration below, the uh, open E string sits on a line underneath the stave. That line that's been added there is known as a ledger line. We need to add those for, for notes that are lower or higher uh, than the stave allows. So that's a ledger line. So the open E is down there on that, uh, that ledger line. The open A string is in the first space. The open D string is in the middle line of the stave. And the open G string is in the top space of the stave. So if you're planning on learning how to read music, just memorising the positions of these four basic notes would be a fantastic place to start. Now, once you know where these notes live on the stave, you can kind of fill in all the blanks and figure out uh, many of the rest of them. And you can see that in the illustration below as well. I've written in all of the notes uh, from the open E up to the, uh, the C at the fifth fret of the G string. That gives us uh, plenty of notes to look at. Now don't worry about memorizing all of these notes for the moment. Just use this uh, example, which you can see in the downloadable PDF as well, as a reference for those notes as and when you come across them. When you look at written music, you'll notice that there are vertical lines that divide the stave up into individual bars. Those lines are known as bar lines, unsurprisingly, and the, the number of notes that you can fit into one bar is dictated by the time signature, something that will become clear as we continue working through this video. So we have vertical bar lines separating uh, the stave into individual bars. Now, at the end of a piece of music, you'll see a final bar line, which is a thick line and a thin line. That brings you, that means that's the end of the piece. That's uh, one to watch out for. And uh, another bar line that you want to be uh, aware of is what we call repeat bar lines, and that is thick line and a thin line, and then two dots either side of the, uh, the middle line of the stave. And what you'll find is that you get these at the beginning and the end of a passage of music that is to be repeated. So you'll see them at the beginning and the end, and that means that you have to play through that passage of music uh, twice. And uh, you'll see that used in a lot of the exercises throughout this course. Now, if you don't see a beginning uh, repeat symbol, so if you don't have that, uh, that opening repeat bar line, that basically means that you should repeat all the way back to the beginning of the piece of music. And again, you're going to see that quite frequently used throughout this course. So we have uh, bar lines, the final bar line, and then we have repeat bar lines, just worth being aware of the existence of all three of those. Now, at the beginning of each piece of music, you'll also see something called a time signature, which is uh, two numbers stacked one on top of each other. The only time signature that you're going to see really in this course is going to be 4-4, four, four, which is uh, the time signature that's used for the majority of, uh, of all Western music, and uh, certainly that's all that we're going to be using in this course. Now, the meaning of those numbers is something that we'll, uh, we'll get onto a little bit later, but essentially it means that we have four 
quarter note beats per bar. So the top number means the number of beats in the bar and the bottom number is the value of those beats. So four quarter note beats per bar. Now alongside the time signature you should also see something called a tempo indication which is a little direction that tells you how quickly the piece of music is going to move and uh, what kind of style that you're going to be playing. And typically this would be shown as a musical note, a quarter note equals and then a number. So for example if you have quarter note equals 120 that means the tempo is going to be 120 quarter notes uh, per minute. So that's what we call the, the, uh, the BPM, or the beats per minute. So that's the tempo indication. And you might see some words uh, accompanying that as well. Words like, uh, you know, describing the style like funk or rock or moderately. Um, words, words like that just, that just give a vague idea of the, uh, the kind of piece of music that you're going to be playing. You might also see, if you're looking through other music books, you might also see some Italian words such as allegro or andante, things like that. Uh, and those, uh, those words um, are typically something that you'd learn if you studied um, music theory through the Royal Associated Board and uh, learned all these kind of Italian and, and, and Greek words that, uh, that give indications of tempo, but they're not typically used in rock and pop music, so for the most part you don't need to worry about those too much. Now you know some of the basics, including the bass clef and the time signature and bar lines and things like that, it's time to start looking at some actual note values. And the first one that we're going to look at is something called the quarter note or crotchet. Now quarter note is the American terminology for this note value and crotchet is the English terminology. It's good to know both, but I'm probably going to be referring to these as quarter notes throughout this course. Now these last for one beat each, and if you take a look at the example below, you can see that we have... Uh, four of these per bar, four, four equals four quarter notes per bar, so that makes sense. And the two notes in question are C and G. Don't worry about memorizing these for the moment, this is really just an illustration of how it works. So I'm going to play you through this example. So one, two, three, four. So as you can hear, one note Per beat. Now it's worth paying attention to the appearance of these quarter notes as well. You'll notice that they have a black filled note head and a stem and they're also uh, individual. They're not attached to each other in any way. So worth memorizing uh, the way they actually look. Now once you know what quarter notes are you also need to know what a quarter note rest looks like as well and from the example below you can see that it's a uh, it's difficult to describe actually, but it's a bit of a squiggly uh, vertical line and that means you just rest for that beat. So I'm going to play you through this example. You can see that you have rests on beats one and three in each bar and then you have notes on beats two and four. So here we go. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay, so those are quarter notes, a really, really important musical value uh, to be aware of. Let's take a look at a second rhythmic value. This one's going to be known as the half note or the minim. Now, half notes last for two beats, which means that they last for half of a bar, hence the name half notes. So half notes is the American terminology and minims is the UK terminology. I'm going to be referring to these as half notes. Now if you take a look at the example below you can see that we have two half notes per bar. The notes that we're going to be using here are C, A, F and G once again. Don't worry about memorizing the positions of these notes for the moment. This is really just an illustration of the rhythm. So let's have a listen to this example. So one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Nice and simple. So those are what we call half notes. Uh, take, uh, take a note of the appearance of the half note as well. These have um, an unfilled note head uh, and a stem. So similar to the quarter notes, but whereas the quarter notes were filled black, these are, uh, these are hollow. Uh, we also need to be aware of the half note rest, which is a fairly simple little symbol. This is a small rectangular block that sits on the, uh, the middle line of the stave. So if you take a look at the example below, I'm just going to play you through that. We have a note on beat one of each bar that lasts for all of beat one and all of beat two, and then beats three and four are going to be silent because we have that rest. So one, two, three, four. 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 
four. So those are half notes, a nice simple rhythm to be working with. The next rhythm is even simpler. This one is known as the whole note or semi-brief. So whole note is the, U, uh, the US terminology and semi-brief is the UK terminology. And these last for an entire bar. So they last for four beats. Very, very simple. Take a look at the appearance though of these whole notes. They basically just have a single note head with no stem. Okay, so let's have a listen to the example below. One, two, three, four. So those are whole notes, very, very simple. Now, you also need to be aware of the whole note rest. Now, this looks a little bit like the half note rest in that it's another little uh, rectangle, but this time it hangs down from the second line of the, of the stave rather than sitting on the middle line. It hangs underneath the second line. So try not to confuse the two. I'm just going to play you through the, uh, the very simple example shown below. So one, two, three, four. Very simple. Okay, so we've now covered uh, quarter notes, half notes, and whole notes. We're now going to move on and look at something called eighth notes. Eighth notes, or quavers as they're known in UK terminology, move a little bit quicker than all of the rhythms that we've looked at so far. And you can have eight eighth notes within a bar of 4-4 four, four time, which is where the name comes from. Now take a look at the appearance of the eighth note. It has a black filled note head, it has a stem, so so far it looks exactly like a quarter note, but it also has a tail coming off of it as well, which uh, indicates that it moves quicker than a quarter note. So you can have two of these per beat. And as you'll see in the example below, uh, when these are uh, played continuously as they are in, in this example, you can group them together by beat. So in the first bar, you can see that they've been grouped together uh, by beat. So you have pairs of eighth notes. And in the second bar, you can see they've been grouped together in groups of four, which you can do on beats one and two and on beats three and four. Now, the way that these notes sound uh, is going to be, you're going to hear a note in between each beat as well. So you can have one and two and three and four and. So I'm just going to play you through this example. So one, two, three, four. and two and three and four and those are eighth notes. Uh, we're going to be playing a lot of these as bass players. Uh, a lot of bass lines are comprised of eighth notes so it's a really valuable note value be, uh, to be aware of. If you take a look at the uh, example below you can see eighth note rests in use. Now these look a little bit uh, different to some of the other rests that we've looked at. They look uh, kind of like a stylized number seven and uh, obviously that means you're going to be resting for that part of the beat. Now in the example below, you can see that we have eighth notes on the second half of each beat. So we're still playing on one, two, three, and four, but then the second half of the beat is going to be silent. And that's going to really just mean that we're playing quite short notes on each beat. And then in the second bar, we have the rest followed by the note. And that's going to mean that we play on the, uh, on the upbeat or on the end of each beat instead. So this example is going to sound like this. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, and two, and three, and four, and. So those are eighth notes. There's a little bit more to get your teeth into with eighth notes than there has been with some of the previous rhythms, but very, very important note value to be aware of. Okay, so we've now looked at many of the basic elements of music notation, and if you've uh, got through this video successfully, you certainly know enough now to be making sense of some of the exercises that follow. Now, as I said, this is not a reading music course, but throughout these video courses, we are going to be looking at some other basic rhythmic values along the way. So by the time you've completed these courses, you should have a very good idea of the basics of reading music, and then if you choose to pursue that uh, beyond this, you'll be well equipped to do so. For all of the exercises throughout these video courses, you're going to see the music presented in music notation, which we've just been talking about, but you're also going to see it written in tablature underneath that as well. Now, tablature is uh, 
a really good way of getting started with the instrument. It's a really good way of getting information off of the page or off of the screen and onto your bass. It does have some drawbacks, but it's a good way uh, for, for getting started. I'm just gonna to explain to you how tablature works. So if you take a look at a tab stave, you're gonna see four lines, and those four lines represent the, uh, the strings of the bass. So the lowest line on the tab stave is the lowest string on your bass, that'll be the E string, and then the highest line on the tab stave will be the highest string on your bass, which is gonna be the, uh, the G string. Now, we're, we're gonna indicate notes uh, using numbers on the, on the tab stave, and that's gonna, that's gonna relate to what fret we're playing. So if we need to show open strings, you're gonna see zeros, and if you, if you wanted to see, for example, the notes at the fifth fret, you would see uh, fives written. Uh, so tab is, is fairly self-explanatory in, in those regards. If we have any instances where we needed to play two notes together, for example, you would stack the notes one on top of each other. So tab's very simple, as I say, but it does have some drawbacks, and you, you're probably noticing these already. Uh, the main drawback really is that it doesn't contain any rhythmic information. So you can be looking at a bar of tab and you'd have absolutely no idea really how it sounds rhythmically without referring to the song or without referring uh, to some kind of audio file or, or other reference to hear how it actually is supposed to sound. So it has a lot of benefits in terms of getting people started with the instrument but it does have some drawbacks as well. Anyway throughout these video courses you're going to see all of the exercises presented in both notation and tab. In this video, we're going to take a look at the basic mechanics of the fingerstyle technique, which is probably the most popular way of playing the bass guitar. So to use this technique, your arm is going to be coming across the bass, across that chamfered area there where it's a little bit more comfortable. And what I recommend that you do at this point is that you anchor your thumb on the pickup. If you have a bass that has two pickups, I recommend putting your thumb on the pickup that's closest to the neck and plucking the string behind it. Now we're going to be plucking the E string initially and we're going to be doing this with the first and second fingers of the picking hand or the index and middle fingers if you prefer. And it's very important when you're doing this that you uh, use the meaty sort of pad of your finger. You don't want to be playing too close to the end of your finger because you'll get more of the fingernail in the sound if you do that and you're going to get a thinner and more brittle tone if you involve the, the sound of the nail too much. So you want to be on the, on the sort of fatter, meatier part of the, uh, of the finger, if you possibly can. And what you're gonna do is just gonna play over and over on that E string, just alternating between your first and second fingers. Doesn't matter which finger you start with, but let's try to alternate them continuously. So something like this. And what you wanna be aiming for when you're playing this kind of thing uh, certainly in these early days, is you want to aim for real consistency in terms of volume and tone. So you want the notes to sound identical, whether they're being played with the first finger or whether they're being played with the second finger. So that's the basic mechanics of finger style technique. Now what I'm going to do now is play you through exercise number one, which is very, very simple. I just played you a sample of it just then. We just can play four bars of, uh, of just playing on that open E string. Uh, so thumb on the pickup, alternating fingers one and two, and we're just gonna play four bars, one note per bar of nice, long, clear E's. It's gonna sound like this. Okay, so just to reiterate a couple of points for when you're working on that exercise, make sure you alternate your fingers as you're playing. Keep that thumb anchored on the top of the pickup there for stability, and make sure you're playing with the pads of the fingers. Don't get too close to the fingernail because you'll get a thinner sound if you do that. You want nice, fat, round bass notes. Okay, so that's the basic mechanics of playing with the fingerstyle technique. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna look at muting. Now, when you're playing the bass, whatever technique you're using, half the battle is really stopping the other strings from making any noise. And um, keeping everything nice and clean is one of the secrets to being a, you know, a good bass player. So what we're gonna look at now is muting, as I said. What we're gonna do is we're gonna involve the fretting hand here. So after we've played uh, one of those open E's, we're gonna bring the fretting hand in just to rest on the strings and stop it from ringing like this.
And you can see that in doing that, I'm able to create much shorter notes. These are what we call staccato notes, where, where notes are a little bit shorter than they would be otherwise. Let's hear that again. Okay, so I'm gonna play you through exercise number two now. Now this is the same as exercise number one. We're playing continuous open E's, one per beat for four bars. But what we're gonna do for every single one of these E's is we're gonna apply some fretting hand muting just to keep each one of those notes nice and short. Now, when you're working with this muting technique, there's a, a small danger that you might hear something called harmonics, and those are high-pitched notes that sound a little bit like this. And those can be created when you bring your fretting hand in uh, to, to stop the string from ringing. If you touch it at certain points, you're gonna create these harmonics. If you do find that happening, what I'd recommend that you do is just move your hand a little bit further down around the third and second frets. You don't get very strong harmonics at that point on the neck, so it's much less likely to happen. Harmonics are really useful tools for bass players, and they certainly do have a place, but for the moment we want to try and avoid uh, creating those when we're using this muting technique. Okay, so let's move on to the next stage of the finger style technique. What we're going to do now is we're going to move from the E string onto the A string. If you take a look at exercise number three, you can see that we're going to be playing two bars on the open E string, and then we're gonna play for two bars on the open A string. Now, the technique that you're gonna use here is exactly the same as before. You're gonna be alternating fingers one and two. But the thing that I want you to try and do is involve something that I call the traveling thumb technique. And that is where the thumb of the picking hand moves according to where you're playing. So when we're playing on the E string, the thumb is anchored on the pickup gives you some stability, gives you a solid place to, to play from. When you come to play on the A string, it's a good idea if you can move your thumb so that it sits on the E string. Now, that's gonna give you the point of stability that you need, the anchor point, but it's also gonna stop that open E string from making any noise. It's not gonna be humming in the background whilst you're playing. Okay, so I'm gonna demonstrate exercise number three for you now. That's two bars on the open E string and then moving across to two bars on the open A string. Okay, so as I said, the most important thing with that exercise is making sure that thumb moves from the pickup when you're playing on the E string across to sit on the E string when you're playing on the A string. Okay, so let's expand this a little bit further. If you take a look at exercise number four in the downloadable PDF, you'll see that we're gonna do this uh, technique across all four of the strings of the bass. So you're gonna be playing for one bar on the E string, and then we're gonna to move to play on the A string. Thumb's gonna to move to sit on the E string. Then we move to the D string, the thumb moves again, and then we're gonna to move to the G string and your thumb is gonna move again. Now, at the point where you're playing on the, on the G string and your thumb is anchored on the D string, you're gonna be muting all of the other strings of the bass really quite successfully because that thumb is not just gonna be muting the D string, it's also gonna be resting against the E and the A strings for the most part, and it's gonna stop those from ringing. And um, If you can get this technique right from the very beginning, you're gonna find that you wind up with a very, very clean and effective finger style technique. Okay, so I'm gonna play you through exercise number four. Okay, so to summarize then, we've looked at the basic mechanics of uh, the finger style technique, and hopefully you found this is not too difficult to do. I just wanna reiterate the important points here. So one of the most important things that you do is alternate your fingers, so alternate between one and two whenever you're playing. Now, you don't need to start with any particular finger. Some people find it more comfortable to lead with the first finger. Some people find it more comfortable to lead with the second. Doesn't matter which one you start with 
as long as you continuously alternate those fingers. So that's really important, as is the traveling thumb technique, keeping that thumb moving across the strings uh, depending on which string you're actually playing on. Those are uh, two of the most important things. Uh, in addition to that, as I said earlier, playing with the, the pads of the fingers rather than playing too close to the end of the fingers. Now, if you follow all of those pieces of advice, you should wind up with a very clean and effective finger style technique, which we can begin to develop over the course of these video courses. In this video, we're gonna take a look at another very popular way of playing the bass guitar, and that is using the plectrum. Now, you don't have to use a plectrum if you're happy enough using the finger style technique, that's perfectly fine, but it's a really good idea for bass players to be able to use the finger style and plectrum techniques. So in this video, I'm gonna show you the basics of using a pick. So you're gonna be holding the pick between the thumb and the first finger of your picking hand, of course, and what you want to try and do is allow about three to four millimeters of the pick to protrude from the, uh, from the ends of your fingers there. And what we're going to be doing is we're just going to be swinging the uh, arm downwards and just playing that open E string. And we're, as, we've, uh, as we discussed back in the uh, video on the finger style technique, we need to aim for consistency with, with every stroke that we, that we play. So we want, to, we want to have everything sounding exactly the same. So we're looking for this kind of thing. Now, when you're using a pick, you would typically be using combinations of downstrokes and upstrokes. And there's a particular way of applying downstrokes and upstrokes. And typically what you would do is when you're playing a note that falls on the beat, which is what we're doing here, we're playing quarter notes, you'd play with downstrokes and then you'd use upstrokes for anything that, uh, that comes on the off beat. Now, for the moment, we're just going to be playing basic quarter notes. So we're only going to be needing to use downstrokes. Okay, so I'm going to play you through exercise number five, which is basically just four bars on that open E string, same as we did back in the, uh, the video for the finger style technique, but of course now we're going to be using a pick. It's going to sound like this. In the previous video, we learned how to use the fretting hand to apply a basic muting technique just by bringing that hand in to stop the string from ringing. Now, because this is a fretting hand technique, this works perfectly well when playing with the plectrum as well. So in exercise number six, I'm going to be playing four bars on that open E again, but this time I'm going to shorten all of those notes by applying the fretting hand muting technique. Okay, so we're now going to move from the E string onto one of the other strings as well. We're going to play on the A string. So if you take a look at exercise number seven, we're going to be playing for a bar on the E string, just quarter notes still, and then we're going to move and play the second bar on the open A string. In the third bar, we'll be back to the E string, and then we go back to the A string for the fourth bar. So we're just going to be crossing strings in a very, very basic way. Now, the technique remains exactly the same no matter what string you're playing on. Uh, you just need to make sure that you're accurately hitting uh, that open A string uh, and not striking the E string at the same time. Might take a little bit of practice, but um, uh, it's a relatively straightforward exercise. Okay, it's going to sound like this. Now, when you're playing that exercise, what you might find is that it's quite difficult to control the open strings, particularly when you move from playing the A string back to the uh, back to playing the E string. And in that instance, it might be useful just to apply a little bit of that fret hand, fretting hand muting, just to stop that string from ringing as you move uh, back onto the E string. Otherwise, you might wind up with the the sound of two strings ringing together, which can sound quite muddy. So, if you find that happening, try to use a little bit of fretting hand muting to stop that from happening. 
Okay, so in exercise number eight, we're going to take this idea to the uh, to the next logical place, and we're going to play across all four strings of the bass. So we're going to be playing in the first bar on the E string, four notes, one per beat. Second bar, we move to the A string, and then to the D string, and then to the G string. Now, as I've said before, the technique remains exactly the same no matter what string you're playing on. You just need to look closely at your picking hand as you're playing and just make sure you're going to be hitting the right string and not striking any of the others as you do this. Okay, it's going to sound like this. Okay, so to finish off this basic lesson in plectrum technique, we're going to look at playing eighth notes and this is going to require us to play some upstrokes as well. So everything we've played so far has just been one note per beat. We've just been playing one, two, three, four. What we're going to do now is we're going to play in between as well. So we're going to play one and two and three and four and. So we're going to be playing eighth notes, two notes per beat. So this kind of thing. And in doing so, we're going to be using downstrokes and upstrokes. Downstrokes on the down beats on each, each beat or each tap of the foot, if you're tapping your foot as you play, and then the upstrokes are the notes in between, the ands, one and two and, down, up, down, up. That's the uh, more logical way of applying the plectrum technique. Okay, so I'm gonna play you through exercise number nine now. This is just four bars playing eighth notes on the open E string. It's gonna sound like this. Okay, so we've now covered the basics of the plectrum technique. Now, as you move through these video courses, you might prefer to work on the exercises using the finger style technique. You might prefer to use the plectrum technique, or you might want to do both. That would be fantastic as well. But uh, either way, you now have a, a good solid grounding in the basics of the plectrum technique. In the previous two videos, we looked at basic finger style technique and basic plectrum technique, and we're now going to turn our attention to basic fretting hand technique. So I want you to fret the note that is at the third fret of the E string. This note is a G. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to put our first finger and we're going to put it down onto the, onto the string just behind the fret wire for the third fret, and we're going to push the string down quite firmly. And when you play the string, you should hear a nice, clean note. So you want a nice, clean note, no fret buzz, no excess noise of any kind. Uh, when I say fret buzz, I mean this kind of noise. I want to try and avoid that. If you hear that noise, it usually means that you're too close to the fret before or too close to the middle of the fret. You want to be just behind the fret wire uh, for, the, for the fret that you're actually intending to play. Now, as you're uh, fretting notes like this, it's very important that you don't press down so hard that you begin to pull the string downwards because you'll, you'll actually raise its pitch if you do that. So don't, uh, don't pull down too hard on that string. You just want to be holding it down firmly, uh, but not pulling the string downwards. Okay, so we're going to uh, put this into practice in an exercise. We're going to be playing through exercise number 10 now. And what we're going to do here is we're going to play for a bar on this G, just playing quarter notes again. And then in the second bar, we're going to move across to the A string, and we're going to play the note at the third fret. And this is a C, which we're going to be playing a bar on the G, and then a bar on the C, and then repeating that process in the third and fourth bars. Okay, it's going to sound like this. Okay, so as you're working on that exercise, there's just a few things that I'd like you to remember. So your fretting hand just needs to be behind the fret wire itself, just to prevent any fret buzz. In your picking hand, you still need to be remembering to alternate your fingers. So one, two, 
one, two, or two, one, two, one, if you prefer to lead with your second. And uh, very important that you use the traveling thumb technique as well. So as you move on to playing the A string, your thumb moves from the pickup to sit on the E string. So there's actually quite a lot to remember just in this very, very basic exercise. And this is all being done in the, um, in the spirit of keeping all of your playing really nice and clean and uh, removing any excess noise from it. It's really good to get into these habits early on. It's, it's more difficult to break bad habits later. Okay, so we're now gonna look at using all four fingers of the, uh, of the fretting hand. And we're gonna be looking at some uh, basic exercises that use what I call the finger per fret technique. And that is basically assigning one finger uh, to, to one fret in a four fret stretch. So if we look at frets one, two, three, and four, we can cover those using uh, all four fingers of the, uh, of the fretting hand. And what we're gonna be basically doing in exercise number 11 is just playing each of these notes sequentially along the E string. The notes themselves, the pitches of the notes, we're not too interested in at the moment. This is really just an exercise for your fretting hand. So we're going to be playing the note of the first fret, the second fret, the third fret, and the fourth fret. Fingers one, two, three, four. And again, you need to remember to make sure your finger stays just behind the fret wire for each one. Now it's important to say that you don't need to hold them all down as you go. So as you come to uh, play the second note, you can be releasing the pressure on that first finger. As you play the third, you can release your fingers, etc., etc. So you don't need to stay in this very rigid hand position. Okay, so let's have a listen to exercise number 11. Okay, so in that exercise, we're just playing those same four notes over and over again. Each and every bar was the same. What we're gonna do now in exercise number 12 is take that idea and apply it to all four strings of the bass. Now, there's a little bit, uh, there was quite a bit for you to remember when you're working on this exercise. So in terms of the fretting hand, you need to uh, make sure that your finger stays just behind the fret wire so you get nice, clean notes. But in terms of your picking hand, you've also got quite a bit to be thinking about. You need to remember to alternate your fingers as you've been uh, doing so far, hopefully. You need to apply the, uh, the traveling thumb technique so that you uh, prevent any excess noise and you need to make sure you're playing with the pads of the fingers uh, rather than the tips so you get nice, round, uh, full sounding notes. Anyway, exercise number 12 is gonna sound like this. Okay, now I've talked through these exercises relatively quickly, but I'd like to say at this point that it, these things can take quite a bit of time to get used to. Um, certainly when you're starting out, stretching across four notes in this way can be really quite difficult to do. So do take these exercises slowly, make them a part of your daily practice routine, and uh, it might take a few weeks for them to get comfortable, but treat these as long-term practice exercises rather than things that you hope to conquer overnight. They, they might take a little bit of time. Okay, we're going to expand on what we've done so far, and we're going to start looking at using different sequences. So far we've just done one, two, three, four, but of course there's lots of different orders in which we can use our fingers. And what we're going to do in exercise number 13 is we're going to be playing uh, the same exercise but backwards. We're going to go from four to three to two to one. And we're going to apply that across all four strings of the bass. It's going to sound like this. Now, of course, there are many different combinations that you could try, and uh, one of my favourites uh, that I use often for warming up is a sequence which goes two, one, three, four, and that's basically just using your second finger on the second fret, first finger to the first fret, 
third finger on the third fret and then fourth finger on the fourth fret. That kind of thing. Okay, let's have a listen to exercise number 14. Okay, so something that I'd like to say at this point is uh, if you're quite young and you're just starting out with the bass, you might find it really quite difficult uh, to play these exercises within the first four frets. If you've got small hands, that can be really uh, quite a big ask. So it's perfectly okay to move all of these exercises up the neck to where the frets are closer together. So if you take all of these exercises, for example, and start them on fret number five, so using frets five, six, seven, and eight instead, you're still covering a four fret stretch using uh, the fingers of your fretting hand, uh, but the, the frets are a little bit closer together at this point and it might be easier if you have particularly small hands. Now as you as you work on these exercises you, you should find that the uh, dexterity and strength in your fingers develops and over time you should be able to move your hand further back down the neck and play these uh, exercises in the lower position as I'm demonstrating here. It's worth bearing in mind that all of these exercises uh, are things that should form part of your practice routine on a daily basis. They're not the kind of things that you crack overnight they're the kind of things that you'll uh, want to work on over the course of, uh, of several months. I mean I still play these these kinds of exercises regularly because they're fantastic for warming up. Okay so the exercises that we've looked at so far represent the finger per fret fingering system. We're going to look at something a little bit different now. Uh, we're going to look at a different fingering system which is something that I refer to as the condensed fingering system and this is similar to uh, a fingering method that's used by upright basis. And it really just means covering three frets with a four finger stretch. And this is particularly useful for bass players because we play a lot of bass lines that cover a three fret stretch. So uh, figures such as this. Now in that example, I'm covering frets five to seven, which is one, two, three frets, but I'm using my first and fourth fingers, just because the fourth finger has a lot more strength in it typically than the third finger. So it's what I call condensed fingering, and it's really useful for bass players. Now what we're going to do in exercise number 15 is we're going to apply condensed fingering to a very simple exercise across all four strings of the bass. So we're going to play on frets three and five, we're going to play a bar of notes on the third fret of the E string, a bar of notes on the fifth fret of the E string, and then we're going to move on to the A string, third fret for a bar, fifth fret for a bar, then onto the D string, third fret, fifth fret. Now the notes that we're playing, the pitches of the notes themselves, uh, are not important at this point. We're, we're really just learning how to use a fingering system, so not, we're not worried too much about the actual pitches that we're playing. Now as you're working through this exercise, uh, do make sure you remember all the things that we've talked about so far, so alternating the fingers of your picking hand, uh, using the nice meaty part of the finger to get a nice full round note, uh, and then, of course, using the traveling thumb technique. Anyway, exercise number 15 is going to sound like this. I'm going to play one final exercise in this lesson and it's based on this condensed fingering technique again. What we're going to do here is we're going to take the exercise that we played before and we're just going to uh, switch strings a little bit more quickly. So we're going to play the first bar on the third fret of the E string and then we're going to move in the second bar to the fifth fret of the A string. In the third bar we move to the third fret of the D string and then in the fourth bar we move to the fifth fret of the G string. So we're changing strings or jumping, uh, crossing strings, I should say, in every bar. But the, the, uh, the fretting hand technique remains exa exactly the same. Okay, so exercise number 16 is going to sound like this. Now, 
as you progress as a bass player and, and you work on your own bass lines, you're going to find certain situations where the finger per fret technique is the most logical way to play and other situations where the condensed fingering technique is the more logical option. And each of these is perfectly valid and they each have many, many different applications. And you, you uh, once you become accustomed to both, you'll switch seamlessly between the two without even really thinking about it. Okay, so that is the basics of the fretting hand technique. Uh, there's quite a lot to remember at this point with all of the various things that we have going on with the picking hand and the fretting hand. So just make sure all of these exercises form a regular part of your practice routine and before you know it, they'll, uh, they'll feel comfortable.